I imagine that I can talk loud enough for people to hear. Can anyone not hear at the back? Okay, uh, the reason I'm using a microphone is not just because I feel more comfortable with one in my hands, but it's for the filming. Uh, so when we, when we come to the panel discussion, we'll be passing it to and fro. Uh, hello, welcome. Thank you for being indoors at the end of a week of, well, at the end of summer, essentially. <laughs> uh, so it's really nice that you've joined us. We know it's only because it's clouded over slightly, but still, we're, we're still happy that you're here. It is a very important debate. Uh, in fact, let's... Could I just sort of, before I introduce the panel, just to take a little straw poll, who in the audience feels that they have been the object or victim of trolling? Okay, a few people. Who in the audience feels that they have been a troll at some point? Nobody, you're all innocent. Well, let's see about that. Uh, okay, so I'm going to introduce our panel. They're going to speak for five minutes each. Uh, though they will use the lectern, both for visibility and for the microphone. Uh, and then we'll probably have a little bit of an argument up here. I'm hoping that some of them will disagree with each other. <laughs> and if they don't, then I will disagree with them, just to keep things lively. And then we'll come out to you, because the whole point of a debate is that you actually get to put your opinions, not just questions. You don't need to do that. This is a point, but I'm going to pretend it's a question. It's a debate. We want your points. We want your thoughts. Obviously, we prefer you to keep it civil, but, you know. Uh, so it's very much about you joining in. So don't, don't relax too much. We want you to join in. So let me introduce the panel in the order in which they're going to speak. We're going to start off with Professor Rob Proctor, Professor of Social Informatics at Warren University and also a <laughs> Turing Fellow here, <coughs> leading research on social media governance, including trolling and fake news. We're then going to go to uh, Nimco Ali, co-founder and director of Daughters of Eve, a Somali feminist, social activist, and independent training consultant, and very active on social media. You may have already come across her. We're then going to go to Brittany Kelly, who's a teaching fellow in digital cultures at King's College London. And her work looks at fan studies and online research methodologies. And then we're going to slide over this way. I hope people behind the pillar can see. If not, there are a couple of individual free seats at the front if you want to move around the pillar and come and sit at the front. Uh, but anyway, just immediately to my left here, we have Ajmina Drodia, uh, Amnesty International researcher on technology and human rights. And then on the far left, hiding behind the pillar if you're at that end of the room, uh, our last minute replacement, straight off the subs bench, it's George Starkey Midder, uh, who's worked with Kick It Out's media team since uh, January 2016. And, uh, and he's also got a lot of qualifications, but I'm not going to read them all out. You'll have to ask him afterwards over Is a glass it of wine. Uh, to have a copy of what you've just read rather than, you know. Uh, well, you will, you will hear their names again as they speak. If you really want a handout afterwards, you could talk yeah, to yeah. Maya on the way out, actually. Uh, so, keeping to a really tight five minutes to save me having to cough and rattle my glass <coughs> ostentatiously, uh, the speakers are now going to kick off with their introduction, starting with Rob Proctor. Thank you. Um, so, I'm a, a Turing Fellow here um, at the Alan Turing Institute, and... Uh, Professor at Warwick University in computer science. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the work I've been doing, um, not only in Turing, but also in related projects such as Digital Wildfire, which is looking at a range of different kinds of behaviors on social media, including misinformation, rumor, and, and trolling. And uh, Media for Security, which is looking at general issues about the risks that social media raises for the security and safety of citizens. So it might be helpful to start with a, a definition of, of what we think trolling is. And unfortunately, there turns out to be quite a wide range of different definitions, beginning with one which is fairly narrow, which is about intentional disruption of an online forum by uh, causing offense or starting an argument, to a definition which embraces much broader range of antisocial behavior, including um, cyberbullying, cyber hate, cyber stalking, revenge porn, and so forth. I think for the purpose of this, this debate, it's helpful to, to, uh, to follow the latter definition, because I think it sort of helps us to understand the, the, the broad range of activities on social media, which we need to um, be able to, to manage uh, and, and, and reduce the effects of. So I will, I will assume that's the one we're going to work with today. 
So um, let's start with um, an example of straightforward trolling, which um, I'm sure you're probably aware of uh, Katie Hopkins and her, um, her life as a, uh, a social media uh, person who uh, tweets uh, remarks like that, which um, is obviously offensive in some way um, and uh, is not likely to, uh, to um, promote uh, good, goodwill and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, sort of people's uh, calmness and, 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 uh, and um, uh, being comfortable in social media. So that's an example of trolling. But of course, um, there are uh, a broad range of issues about whether you know, Katie Hopkins and other people have a, a right to say things of that kind in, in these spaces. So it comes down in some ways to uh, balancing freedom of expression against freedom from harm, um, which is a balance that tends to vary according to different cultures. Um, and we see quite a difference between, for example, how that balance is interpreted in Europe. And this is a statement from the European uh, Court of Human Rights, which uh, acknowledges that people have the right to say uh, what they wish, but they have to do so uh, acting responsibly, taking uh, account of, of other people and the harm that what they say might cause them. And that's the context in which we operate in Europe. In the US, I think the balance is somewhat different, with more emphasis upon right to say what you like and less of an emphasis on uh, freedom from harm. And it's one of the problems that makes it rather complicated to, to then arrive at a way of, of, of policing social media, of enacting good governance, which will, uh, which will assure that uh, the balance between these two different principles is actually effectively managed. So why should we be concerned about trolling and these other kinds of behaviours that I remarked on a few moments ago? Well, they do cause harm. We have evidence that uh, uh, cyber hate bullying and so forth, causes harm to individuals and groups in society. So there are real issues here that we need to deal with. Um, hate speech can lead, can lead through into acts of violence in the real world. And that, of course, uh, is something that uh, everybody, I think, would want to uh, avoid and, and to uh, make sure it does not happen. So it's clearly a case that we need to uh, have stronger governance of, of people's behavior in social media, so we can avoid these harms to individuals and groups. So one question is, what can social media platforms do to provide better governance? Well, they are developing moderation policies. You may have read some of the news items about items, posts being taken down. And even in some cases, people have been banned. So one case is um, Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, who was tweeting a, on a range of different subjects, and he's been banned from Twitter because his tweets were uh, judged to be beyond uh, the boundaries of what could be acceptable, and he wasn't desisting, so he's been banned. We also see, interestingly enough, that um, platforms are also under pressure from um, advertisers to make sure that uh, they don't uh, um, create context in which advertisers would feel uncomfortable where that when their advertisers, when their advertisements appear in, so in social media. So there's some economic pressure on, on platforms to, uh, to enact better governance and, and to moderate content. A question that um, is of interest, obviously, to the Turing Institute is what can big data do? Now, it's possible to build um, uh, algorithms that will be able to detect uh, various kinds of, of, of trolling, hate speech, and so forth. But they don't um, function with complete accuracy um, they will sometimes identify content which is, is not um, judged to be offensive. Sometimes they will also miss content that is offensive. So uh, the present time, I cannot say that um, algorithms, machine learning, are an answer to the problem of being able to identify content which should not be uh, allowed to, to, uh, to be uh, on social media. We need to uh, combine algorithms with human judgment, with moderators. And there, of course, is a problem because there's a large volume of content to actually uh, examine to decide whether it should be taken down or not, even when you have algorithms to try and filter uh, that, that content that needs to be examined. So the, the next question is, what can people do? And uh, what we're seeing, I think, in a lot of cases is what we call counter speech. 
So here's an example of how Katie Hopkins was challenged by another person on Twitter um, to explain herself uh, why she was tweeting about uh, uh, ginger uh, babies in that way and, and calling her out for, 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 for making those remarks. Now, this is the kind of thing which I think uh, has a lot of promise, but it, it, it does call for us to take individual responsibility uh, when we see content which we think might be offensive. So uh, it kind of reminds us that um, in some ways social media governments is the responsibility of everybody who is on, on these platforms and not just of the platforms themselves. And what we've seen emerging are accounts like this, for example, called Yes, You're Racist, where people put in effort to try and identify content which they think might be um, racist and engage the people who are tweeting in these ways in order to sort of try and tease out their arguments and refute them. Note they do it in a quite a humorous way rather than trying to sort of challenge them in, 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 in an aggressive way. And I think we're seeing quite a lot of this kind of more mobilized and, and, and managed effort to, to introduce moderation and, and better governments into social media. Finally, here are some questions I think we need to uh, think about, which we'll perhaps be able to address uh, this evening. So um, at that point, I'll hand over to the next um, panelist. Thank you very much, Rob. I hope you've all taken in that dense list of questions. Would you, would you like to read a couple out or yes. summarise them? Okay, so um, where does responsibility lie? So I've talked about individual responsibility, the responsibility of, of, of platforms, uh, what the legal and moral responsibilities are. Does the law need to be changed, for example? Um, how can law enforcement agencies uh, improve their efforts to identify content which breaks... Uh, breaks laws and, and, and identify culprits. Um, Community-driven uh, counter-trolling actions like the kinds I sh I've shown you, will they work? Can we refine them, improve them so that uh, they act as a way of, 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 of toning down uh, the, 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 the probabilities of, of, of uh, abusive uh, content on social media? Sometimes anti-trolling itself can become trolling. So what is the boundary between um, uh, reacting to trollers um, where you might uh, become yourself seen to be trolling the trollers? Um, and whole legal and policy frameworks, I think, uh, are under review in order to, um, to see whether this new world of social media, the, the kind of communications it affords, is, is, is properly subject to, to the rule of law and people are accountable for their actions. Thank you very much. Who trolls the trollers? There's a question to take away. Uh, right, there's plenty there to pick up on, uh, so lots to discuss. But first, we're going to hear from the rest of the panel. Uh, so first of all, uh, Nimco Ali. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to follow that very academic um, presentation with not such an academic one. Um, oops, sorry. Um, I, like, I think in this conversation, I might be um, one of the most favourite people that, um, that gets trolled online. I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm an activist, and I'm also critical of Jeremy Corbyn. So, <laughs> so my life on Twitter on a day-to-day -day basis is being trolled. And... One of the key um, reasons why I haven't backed off the platform is how open um, and how equalizing the platform is in a democratic kind of context. When I started my activism, I specifically chose Twitter because it was the only place where you could have direct access to people that were governing our country and shaping the, um, the lives of girls um, around the world. I um, started to advocate against ending FGM, which is female genital mutilation. It's an organized um, form of gender-based violence which has gone on for 4,000 years. So the idea when Twitter came along, I left my job in civil service to actually troll one specific minister. Well, not troll, just harass her. Um, because I really wanted to have a conversation about her <coughs> interpretation of what FGM was. And my first interaction, and most, uh, my mo most successful interaction, which has led to the point that I can sit here today and say, I think by 2030, we can have a, um, an FGM-free world, 
was a minister tweeting a picture of her sitting with former, uh, with, with current um, exercises or women who were cutting girls and community leaders and saying that we need to have conversations with these people. So I replied back to her and I said, would you sit down with a bunch of paedophiles to address sexual violence against children? And she replied back to me and said, um, what is your experience and have you been to Africa recently? which I replied back saying, my experience is a day-to-day, -day, um, my, my, my experience is every single day living with the consequence of FGM and don't try to out-Africa me. Well, <laughs> saying that on a public platform um, like Twitter felt that she was being attacked and being trolled, so she called me in for a private meeting. Um, since then, I've used that platform to constantly create a dialogue with people who've been affected by FGM and those who are standing as the gatekeepers. So for me, um, the, the problem with trolling is that it does silence the voice of women like me. I was seven when I was cut. I had a voice, but I didn't have a platform. I was 28 when I left my job and took to Twitter. And five years on, I have a voice because I have a platform. So one of the key things is how do we deal um, with people like me who want to change the world and those that disagree with me. I don't believe in blocking. I don't believe in removing people from, from these platforms. But I do believe that what is said online can have a physical and real consequence in, um, in um, the real world. On a day-to-day -day basis, I get death threats and I get rape threats. Twitter doesn't take that seriously. Twitter um, doesn't think that it's something that needs to be reported and something that needs to be done. And the idea that I can take that to the police is something that pe people see as laughable. So in the broader conversation here, because I like to talk and have a conversation, is how can we work together to ensure that women like me and women who are fighting for um, equal equality are not actually silenced? Because that is the biggest issue. So yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that and just looking forward to your questions. Fantastic. Thank you that you've got right to the right to the crux of it there that social media has enormous potential to give everyone a voice but then how do you keep that open while defending against the the the, the problems that come with that fantastic look we're getting loads of questions coming up i hope you lot are making notes ready for your points that you're going to make uh, okay now we're going to come to Brittany, Brittany kelly teaching fellow in digital cultures do you have slides one slide from Brittany. If, if you can remove yourself from this tightly packed row of chairs. Very, very friendly over there. Um, all right. Nope, wrong direction. Aha, there we are. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Brittany Kelly, and I'm a teaching fellow in digital cultures at King's College London. Um, I do a lot of work with online fan fiction. What I've got on the side of the slide there is basically just me struggling with Photoshop to represent one of the most popular pairings in Harry Potter fandom, and that is, of course, Harry Potter and Draco Malfoy. So this evening, I just wanted actually to open up with two very brief stories um, as a way to work into a concept that I've been working with for a while now when I think about ethics, and that is vulnerability. When I was 13 years old, after a life-changing introduction to Nirvana um, through their a rerun, actually, of their unplugged performance on MTV, I became a fan for life. In my enthusiasm for my discovery, I decided that a friend and I should make a website about them. I supplied the ideas, she supplied the tech. I actually made hundreds of flyers and distributed them throughout the school. Yes, I was that kid. A few days later, we had a few visits, besides our own, of course, and our very first comment. I was extremely excited to see what other people had to say about our baby. The comment read, this website blows. I was enraged and a little bit heartbroken. Unfortunately, my friend and I soon abandoned the website. And for my part, I didn't really try to do anything techie like that for a very, very long time. A few years later found me jumping onto the LiveJournal bandwagon with my friends in high school. I really loved this site because in the words of 15-year-old me, I could make it like super edgy. I treated that space like a personal journal as well as a personal messaging service. We all did. 
While we did use pen names, my friends and I, and we didn't include any of our real pictures or locations, we basically put whatever we wanted to there without any kind of searching for privacy settings or censorship, which is generally how LiveJournal worked in the early days. It was a place that seemed very open for us because we could share our ideas. At the same time, unfortunately, we all too often used it as a place to air our grievances about each other. And at one point, when one of the friends in the group broke up with her boyfriend, it did become a place for some pretty serious bullying, at least on the part of the ex-boyfriend. And all of this before Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat, no less. For some context, I graduated high school in 2004. So you might be wondering, why is she telling us these stories? And you might be thinking, things are very different now than they were then, right? And they are, to a certain extent. I'm telling these stories because, for me, as someone who now does a lot of research in online communities and teaches other people how to do that as well, I've actually been reflecting a lot on my early days in the internet and what I can learn from those experiences. It's helped to raise the question for me about how would I like it if someone were to write an academic article or any article about my teenage live journal to, um, entries. I'd have to say I'd be very, very unhappy if that were to happen. And so working from that, for me, I realized I treated those as really kind of private entries, even though I posted them publicly. Fan studies scholar Bethan Jones says of fans, when they post a story online, it's like a private act in a public space. In thinking about my early online experiences and in thinking about my roles as a teacher and a researcher, and yes, an online fan now, a recurring concept has come back to me, and that's the concept of vulnerability. When we talk about vulnerability, we tend to think it just means weakness. And yes, that is involved. But for me, as I've begun to think about vulnerability more deeply, it's become a stronger concept, a deeper concept, because I've realized it has two sides. Yes, certainly it's the possibility that you will be harmed, but it is also the possibility that you will harm someone. More so, it is the power to affect and be affected. For me, vulnerability has had a huge impact on how I've approached my own research methods online and how I approach teaching. And certainly as an individual online, it's made me much more careful as well as more open. Certainly it's made me a little bit more careful about what I share, but even more importantly, it's made me think very much about how my own words, my own presence, and my own actions in online spaces might potentially affect someone else. For me, I think that this openness to vulnerability, this acknowledgement of it, this sense of goodwill that can arise from it, might be one of the key ways for us to think about a better online future, particularly in relationship to things like cyberbullying, trolling, and ethics more generally, both on an individual grassroots level and on a larger legislative level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bethany, introducing a new way of thinking about the problem. No, I don't know if you can get out all right. <laughs> it's going to get more and more exciting as we get further this way. So you're going to have to do a backflip across the, the desk when it comes to you, George. Uh, so Ashmina Drodia, uh, researcher at Amnesty International. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Asmina Drodia, and I am a researcher at Amnesty International Secretariat um, in the Technology and Human Rights team. Uh, my particular focus looks at abuse against women on social media platforms. Um, so for about 16 months, I conducted qualitative and quantitative research about violence and abuse against women on social media platforms with a specific focus on Twitter. Um, when we talk about trolling, quote unquote, um, we obviously, we're a human rights organization. So when I talk about this issue, I'm looking at it through the human rights framework, which means I'm looking at it through a freedom of expression angle. I'm looking at it as a violence against women issue. And I'm also looking at it as a discrimination issue. And you know, when I'm talking about this issue, we call it violence and abuse against women. And the reason we use that term is because you know, there's a lot of definitions about what trolling or cyberbullying or, you know, hate speech um, entail. 
but we thought that violence and abuse really um, encapsulated the plethora of experiences um, that women face online when they speak out on social media platforms. So, you know, it includes um, both direct and indirect threats of violence. It includes sexist or misogynistic commentary. It includes um, racism or transphobia or any other type of identity-based abuse. Um, we look at this intersectionally, which means that we're not just looking at um, you know, just the abuse that a woman can face on the basis of her gender, but also how other aspects of a woman's identity can work um, and intersect with her experience of abuse online. Um, we also look at it um, as doxing, which is a privacy violation, um, and it's basically when someone uploads private information about you um, with the aim to cause you distress or alarm. So if someone were to put up my email address or my um, home address on, on a social media platform um, with the hopes that someone would, you know, uh, caused me some stress by doing that. Um, and then the other thing we look at um, in this in this definition is uh, private and sexual in intimate images of women uploaded without their consent, which is often referred to as revenge porn. Um, and so what we found in our 16 months of research is that women are facing, um, particularly if they're public figures, um, an array of you know violent and abusive experiences online. And that when um, you know Twitter has a responsibility to respect human rights, and when they fail to adequately deal with this issue, women are being either silenced or censored as a result. So that means that women are limiting their interactions online. They're they're taking Twitter breaks, um, or you know just taking a few days off or the weekend off from social media. Um, they are thinking five or six times before they post anything online. So they're, they're really censoring their content um, or they're just getting offline completely um, because you know there are psychological harms as well that we found associated with um, experiences of violence and abuse. Um, so I wanted to touch really quickly upon some research that we did um, that used machine learning to detect online um, abuse against female parliamentarians in the UK that were active on Twitter. Um, and so the research that we did looked at the period of January 1st to June 8th, 2017. So June 8th was the snap election in the UK in 2018. And we used a machine learning system to detect abuse against all female MPs that were active on Twitter during this time. Um, and our findings were, um, you know, shocking, but unfortunately, given all of the qualitative research that I had been doing in the process, weren't particularly surprising. Um, so what we found was that well, first of all, we basically um, use machine learning to classify almost 1 million tweets that were sent to female parliamentarians. And we found that 25,688, which I think is about 2.85%, were found to be abusive. And within that, we found that Diane Abbott, who uh, many of you will know is the first black female MP in the UK and is also the shadow home secretary, um, alone received almost half of all abuse um, in the six weeks prior to this uh, June 8th election. Um, and in the entire period of analysis of the, you know, from January 1st to June 8th, she received about 31%, so almost a third of all abuse. That means that she received 10 times more abuse than any other woman MP in the six weeks leading up to the election, and eight times more abuse in the entire period of analysis. So you can see here in this chart that the number of abusive tweets that Diane Abbott received alone was higher than the number of abusive tweets that female MPs in both the Scottish National Party and some conservative parties received. Um, I think that I, want, I wanted to show an example of the type of abuse that Diane Abbott receives, um, and I apologize for making you see it, but I also think it's incredibly important to um, help distinguish that we're not talking about political criticism here. Um, as a politician, Diane Abbott is actually, you know, in, in under human rights law, um, so is, uh, should be subjected to a higher threshold of criticism simply because of her position in politics and the power that she has. Um, but nothing about the, these tweets um, are constructive. Um, and, you know, our research also really helped, um, again, demonstrate the intersectional analysis of online, of online abuse. So using machine learning was really helpful because not only did it allow us to look at the volume and the scale of online abuse against female MPs, but it also helped us look at who's being targeted. And so what we found that even when you take Diane Abbott out of the equation, because the abuse against her was so disproportionate, that um, black and Asian women MPs in Westminster receive 35% more abuse. Um, so again, it's not just about a woman's gender, it's also about her race or her ethnicity and how that interplays with her, the, her experience of abuse online. Um, and we also found that Asian women MPs, despite only making up 8.8% of female MPs in Westminster, uh, received 132 abusive tweets per MP, which is 30% higher than white women MPs um, in the UK. 
Um, but I think it's also really important because our research also showed that online abuse cuts across political parties. Um, so when we looked at the top five women who received abuse, both in the six weeks leading up to the election and the entire period of analysis, you can see that women from the three largest political parties were represented, so Labour, SNP, and the Conservatives. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to end with um, a project that we're doing right now, um, which again is looking at how to use big data and machine learning to you know, further detect and analyze online abuse. And it's called the Amnesty Decoders Project, and the, the title is the Troll Patrol. And what we're doing is we are um, using digital volunteers and engaging them in microtasking. So basically we're giving them large volumes of data to, to analyze that can help researchers like myself, who will never have enough hours in a day to do this myself, uh, to classify and label tweets that are sent to female politicians and journalists. Um, so when we do that, we're asking to, um, to quant it will help us quantify the scale of abuse that these women are receiving, but also the type of violence and abuse. So when someone sees a tweet, it can either not be abusive, um, it could be abusive or problematic, and then once they choose um, you know, whatever category it is, if it's abusive or problematic, they can choose whether it's racist or sexist or homophobic, um, you know, other. But that will help us, again, not just look at the quantity of abusive tweets, but also um, how these tweets are targeting different individuals. Um, and the goal, and the sort of medium to long term, is to use this data that's generated um, to sort of train an algorithm that detects online abuse, um, you know, to a sort of gold standard. Um, obviously, having more labeled data to train the machine learning system is is very useful. So um, we're aiming to do 500,000 tweets. Thank you. Marvelous, thank you. You're all doing very well, sticking to time. Maybe not to the second, but certainly very well to time. So we'll have plenty of time for discussion. So so finally, slightly disappointed you're not going to do a flick flack along the touch line here. Uh, OK, fair point. Uh, so, uh, so George Starkey Midder, am I saying your name right? Yes, you are. Good, right. excellent. George Starkey Midder from Kick It Out. Um, so, my name is George. I work at Kick It Out, um, which is football's equality and inclusion organisation. Many of you may have come into contact with us through um, that. Us, our t-shirts sometimes before football games um, uh, clubs wear our t-shirts but we do far more I promise you um, so we work in a number of areas basically through the kind of community grassroots and educational sectors um, to educate about uh, discrimination to sort of encourage inclusive practices and campaign for positive change in football as well as using it as a tool to kind of influence wider society uh, we are also a reporting bureau meaning that um, if there's any incident of discrimination uh, that occurs in football um, whether that's in a stadium you know professional stadium or you know down down the park on a Sunday um, or on social media people can report to us um, and we will then take that up with either, uh, depending on the, the nature of the offence and how serious it is, it may be that we liaise with the police, we have close relationships with them. We also will, if it's um, online, um, we will obviously report that to the social media platforms. Um, and uh, if it's involving a player, if a player has tweeted something discriminatory, for instance, we will also report it to the FA and then they may face a ban oh um yeah so just to give you sorry about that um yeah so in terms of our sort of um reporting uh, procedures uh, we sort of we receive about um last year we received about 470 um in, uh, reports of incidents of discrimination um, and 197 of those last season were um, social media based uh, incidents um, and obviously uh, sort of at the halfway point in this season was 109 so it's basically got going up year on year in the last five years but bear in mind these are the, the incidents that people will actively report to us we don't have the resources as a charity to go out there and search for these incidents and we know this is just the tip of the iceberg but this is what we're actually um, receiving to us um, and yeah, so I mean, it's a problem that's been getting worse and worse every year and is becoming increasingly more uh, a central part of our work. And um, the next slide, which you did see briefly, just issue uh, a slight warning, there is quite a lot of um, quite uh, graphic um, language and discriminatory language, but um, at, you know, at, 
as has already been said, I think it's actually quite important that we see the reality of, of what people are facing, you know, and it's all, all well and good kind of censoring it, but actually this, this is something that, that, that is happening on a daily basis. So um, this is just some of the, the stuff that we, um, that we see that clearly, as, as has been said before, is not, you know, it's not anything to do with anyone's footballing ability. It's just outright abusive, malicious um, discriminatory behaviour designed to, you know, target the person um, and and sort of cause them harm. Um, so, um, actually, where we, because obviously, like I said, it's, we don't have the resources to be, um, you know, going out there and looking for um, every incident of discrimination, but we also wanted to get a sense of the, the wider scale of the problem because we know it's what the reports we're getting is just the tip of the iceberg. So we actually ran a campaign a couple of years ago called the Click It Out campaign, um, a social media a campaign to raise awareness about social media discrimination, and it was also backed up by research because uh, actually initially, um, about a year or so before, um, we commissioned a piece of research between that lasted about nine months um, and it was basically analysing discriminatory posts sent to Premier League clubs, fans and players. So that's 20 clubs, their sets of fans and their players. Over a nine-month period, um, we found 134,000 um, discriminatory posts. And bear in mind, again, it's probably far, far higher than that because, um, you know, we entered in probably 30, 40 different discriminatory words. It wouldn't have been able to pick up um, misspelt discriminatory words. And obviously the people who post these things don't always care about getting the spelling right. Um, so, so, yeah, off the back of that, we then ran a similar campaign over the Euro 2016. Um, again, over a month period this time. Um, and that was just, we looked at uh, England, Wales, Northern Ireland um, and the Republic of Ireland, plus two or three players from each of the other kind of uh, 20 teams in the tournament. And 22,000 posts over four weeks. Again, tip of the iceberg. Um, so you really just get a sense of the scale of, of the issue there. Um, you know, this is thousands and thousands um, of posts happening, you know, pretty much every day across the platforms. And for instance, on a platform like Twitter it's much easier to find everything because it's all public on a platform like Facebook it you know the, the problem is largely hidden because you know there are so many private groups and um, there are so many different um, uh, you know places where you, you can't find find this discriminatory stuff so and, and but we certainly know that it's out there um, so yeah so that is pretty much it from my end and uh, yeah thank you Thank you very much. So, lots of uh, lots of questions and thoughts there. Before I come out to you, uh, because we do have forty five minutes left, so uh, there is plenty of time. I just wanted to put a couple of questions to the panel. I'm afraid we're going to have to do this by passing the microphone along, just for the benefits of the of the filming. <sighs> no, you need your pen. I can tell, look at this lot, they're going to ask really hard questions and you're going to need to write them down. <laughs> so a couple of questions, and, and I will literally just pass the microphone along, I'll, starting with Rob because he's had the most time to think about it. We've heard a lot about what the problems are. We've heard some suggestions that possibly machine learning, AI data can be used to detect things. But we haven't really got into the nitty-gritty of what do we actually do about posts uh, anywhere in the range from uh, people using abusive language to uh, out-and-out threats, things that, that can have a very tangible and immediate impact on the physical your physical life as well as your online life. So there's two questions, really, that I'd be interested to know your thoughts on. One of them is, who's responsible for classifying what is and is not acceptable online? I mean, whether that is a human being or, a, or an algorithm, who do we want to be responsible for deciding where the line should be drawn about what's acceptable? And the related question is really then, who should act and what should they do? Do we need to look at the law at uh, making things illegal or maybe enforcing existing laws about making acts of expression illegal. And um, bearing in mind that we're already talking in a, a world where a teenager was 
uh, sentenced for posting rap lyrics on Instagram. Uh, so different, the same words in different contexts can mean very different things. So who's responsible for classifying them? And then what should we do about them and, and who should act? Is this a case for law enforcement? Is it a case for the police? Is it something that the platform should be responsible for? What sort of things should we ourselves feel responsible for uh, responding to in what we think is the best way? So, so just a small question there. Uh, Rob, maybe you'd like to start and then just if you'd like to pass the microphone along. Thank you. So um, in terms of uh, the question of how um, one can arrive at a decision about whether some content um, should be uh, removed from these online spaces, um, I think uh, we have to begin with, with uh, what, um, what the law says is uh, um, permissible to, um, to express. Uh, and of course, um, that covers content such as racist, homophobic, sexist, and so forth, and discriminatory. Um, but these, these laws, to be applied in, in uh, everyday social media governance, have to be interpreted by um, people who work for the platforms, the moderators, um, and um, working in conjunction with algorithms which can help to filter uh, which posts might be potentially uh, subject to being removed, um, they, they will try to interpret uh, the, the laws, the statutes, um, when, when they look at each, each piece of content and decide whether they uh, indeed uh, you know, match what the law dictates. Of course, they will make mistakes, and we've seen that uh, in, uh, in a number of cases. Um, but I, what I try to point out, and I think we've heard from other speakers today, is that um, besides the platforms themselves, it's, I think it is a responsibility of everybody in society, everybody else who's on these platforms, to, um, to take part in um, trying to uh, discourage people from behaving in ways which are antisocial and abusive. Um, just as we, as citizens, uh, have a, a responsibility in the offline world uh, to, um, to act if we see, see people being abused in, in public spaces, in pubs, in restaurants, or anywhere. It's a responsibility of citizens to, to make our feelings known uh, where we see people behaving in ways which we think are antisocial and abusive and, and, and affecting the health and well-being of other people. So I think we have to encourage individuals to react when we see content which I think is, um, crosses a, a border borderline between what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And of course, people's judgments will vary, um, just as they do when we see things happening in the offline world. But I think if we can mobilize more uh, community effort, perhaps also supported by the efforts of, uh, of organizations like Kick It Out, then uh, we can bring a lot more um, effort and, and, and uh, uh, real power to, uh, to managing uh, these, these spaces and discouraging people from being abusive uh, and, and helping them to, to understand how uh, behavior can affect other people. So I, I would encourage um, a broad approach, um, beginning, beginning with the law and its interpretation by, by the platforms, but then also involving community groups and individuals to play their role in identifying content and behaviors which they think is antisocial and trying to educate people to, to behave way, in ways that are more responsible and are not going to cause uh, harm and, and stress to, to other people. Um, yeah, I agree um, with everything. I think, so one of the really interesting things about Twitter is that until recently, its board was very um, male and pale. So, and they are not the people that get attacked the most. They are the people that do a lot of the attacking on um, on so social media. So I think, I think that diversifying those people who are on these boards, because unless you've had some lived experience of what it's like to be trolled or what it's like to be abused or what it's like to fear for your own safety because of a tweet, I think it's very hard for you to understand that in, in, in the context of a boardroom and to, to deliver policies and so on. Um, I, I'm really skeptical and concerned about 
using legislation in order to control trolling. I think the media, the social media platforms have a role, have a bigger role to play. And I think it should be seen as a privilege to be on these platforms and not as a right. So um, Facebook has a lot more, um, ask for more content before you open an account. With Twitter, there's people that can have seven or 17 accounts or one account or whatever it is. So it's about looking at how these, um, how these um, platforms engage with their customers because these people are customers and these people are be beneficiaries as well. so those that are doing um, the trolling and let's also talk about the digital native ge generation I am in my early 30s so I've I remember a world before being online on every single day so the mental um, um, the, the mental health consequences of online conversations are completely different to what, what they were in my lifetime. And I think each and every one of us has made a mistake and said something really stupid, but, but we probably wrote it on a, on a school wall or something else like that because we were angry at somebody. But the idea, so I think we have to control where, um, how we treat people who commit um, acts of trolling online. The idea of somebody saying something at 15 and then that coming back at them 25 years later, I think it's something that we really have to be con concerned about. So I think more dialogue and more conversations with the providers of these platforms is something that I would be more interested in rather than legislation. I'd like to uh, second that actually. I, um, I too am very skeptical about depending upon law. I think, I think really it comes back around to the question of who should decide. I'd be very, very concerned about um, basically just the, the dominant group in power, whether that's on the platform or off of the platform, making decisions about what counts as um, trolling and or hateful speech and what doesn't. Um, so I do think that making much more of an effort to diversify those is important. Um, in terms of involving the police, that was one of the questions that you asked. I think that it's important to remember that involving the police is much more dangerous for some communities than others. Um, and we've seen that reflected in recent um, horrible things that just Starbucks has done, but we've also seen that all across Twitter as well. So I think that I would, I would definitely second this concern about making sure that everyone is involved, but also making sure that groups that have not had much of a voice are given one is really, really important. One final thing, I just more of like a commercial, but when I, I keep thinking about what are some of the more personal ways that we can think about this, um, I think a lot about Dylan Maron's recent work with conversations with people who hate me. Um, and the reason I find that so interesting as a way maybe to think about how to address these on a personal level is because what he does is he brings it back around to humanizing each person on either side of it. Not that everyone deserves necessarily to be humanized for horrible things that they've said, but I do think it's an interesting approach that goes beyond just the algorithm or to beyond just law enforcement, which can be very limiting in our approaches to these issues since there are actually people on other, either side of the screen. That's a good point. My rule of thumb is if it's an anonymous account that's never tweeted before, I don't respond, but otherwise, Yes, see, see who's on the other side of the tweet. Um, yeah, just to really echo what you were all saying, but I think it's really important to recognize that um, social media platforms have codes of conducts and community guidelines. So Twitter has um, a hateful conduct and abuse policy, which actually very clearly, or pretty clearly at least, says that violence and abuse against women and other marginalized groups is not tolerated on the platform. So the problem isn't necessarily the policies, but it's about how it's being enforced. Um, and I interviewed dozens of women, mainly high-profile journalists, bloggers, politicians, um, and so many of the women told me repeatedly that even when they bothered to report the abuse to Twitter, um, often one of two <coughs> things happened. One would be that uh, they would just never hear back from, from Twitter. So they would take the time to report, and then many, many use the term, it just went into a black hole. Um, so they just reported, and then nothing ever happened. Um, and then the second was they would report something that was very clearly abusive and Twitter would come back and say, this is not in violation of our community standards. So I think there's a lack of um, interpretation and a lack of understanding about what constitutes violence and abuse on Twitter. Um, and if they have these community guidelines that say, you know, forms of abuse and violence aren't um, allowed on the platform, then I think they need to be far more clear about how they're, how they're interpreting this. Um, because I think it will also save people um, like me from reporting instances of abuse if I know that they're not abusive. Um, 
I think it's also really important to understand, and I know that you were touching upon this, but how the, how the moderators are being trained. So obviously moderators have a really, really difficult job. They're often only given you know 10 seconds or something to, to make a decision about an abusive tweet. You have to look at the context. It, it's not an easy job. But you know, Twitter, for example, is not transparent about the number of moderators that they employ. They're not transparent about how many are employed per region or by language, um, and exactly how they're being trained to interpret what violence and abuse is, um, you know, how they're complying with international human rights standards. Um, so I think there's a lot of information that we don't have about how these social media companies who say this, this form of behavior or these behaviors aren't tolerated, tolerated on our platform are actually interpreting this. Um, and so one of our biggest calls with the research was really asking for Twitter to be far more transparent about how they're enforcing their own guidelines and to be far more transparent about telling us how they're doing it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I guess from my perspective, obviously, um, our organization as a reporting bureau, I ha I'm probably leaning more on the side of the necessity of legislation. And we, we work quite closely with Facebook and Twitter. And um, to be frank, I, I think the issue is that there is not, um, there's not really political will there or the will um, from these platforms to step up and do the job, um, you know, that, that people would like them to do. Um, I think, you know, I, I appreciate the concerns around, you know, who gets to decide what, what hate speech is and stuff, but I think we actually already have laws that decide what, what hate speech is. So, uh, you know, and, and, and we have laws that decide, you know, what is discrimination, you know. So I, I don't see that um, as, as much of, of an issue, I, I think. Um, touching it a little bit there in terms of enforcement it, it is a key key thing here because I think that the platforms do do know what constitutes discriminatory behavior but they don't um, have the will to employ enough staff um, to, to, to to do the moderation um, and you know I mean Mark Zuckerberg himself said uh, to not two three weeks ago that they think it'll be sort of five to ten years before AI um, it, it can reliably detect hate speech. So I think ultimately it, it, it's not that legislation is the be all and end all, there very much needs to be sort of a multifaceted approach here and I think it's important to encourage, um, you know, encourage culture changes and stuff like that. And, and I mean in fact that's something that Facebook are doing, um, so they're running something at the moment called the Online Civil Courage Initiative that they started about a year and a half ago that Kick It Out are one of the organisations that are actually part of that. Um, and as part of it, the as part of it, they're bringing together um, community organisations, organisations like ourselves, but others that don't work in football, to try and tackle the issue and to share knowledge. And they're also providing a lot of free advertising um, for those organisations that, that deliver counter speech and stuff like that. But ultimately, you know, Facebook when they launched the, the initiative, they started off by um, sort of bragging, if you will, about the fact that they're now up to 2 billion users a month. They also made a promise 30 seconds later that they would increase their moderators, I think, from about roughly 3,000 to 4,500. And there didn't seem to be a lot of awareness there of the disconnect between the two statistics that they've just given us. Um, you know, 4,500 to 2 billion, what that'd be about 11, I think my maths is brilliant, but 11 million comments each, you know, whatever it would, might be. So I think it, uh, there really needs to, I think there needs to be an understanding that actually, you know, in terms of use of social media, the horse is bolted. There's too many people on social media just to wait for a, a, a you know, a cultural change. Because in the meantime, whose lives, you know, are going to be ruined or who's going to be targeted or what real life consequences are going to happen. I don't think we can wait 10 years or, you know, I mean, it's great to educate the next generation about behaviour online and stuff like that, but I don't think we can afford to wait 20 years for there to be a, a culture change that may or may not come. <coughs> right, good. So we've got a range of views there. Not the complete range of views. And if anyone in the audience is a free speech fundamentalist and says there should be no controls, it's a jungle out there, it's only digits, you should get out there and um, have a thicker skin, then I'd be very interested to hear from you. Uh, likewise, if anyone feels nobody's going far enough here and uh, anyone who uses a bad word online should be banged up for life, let's hear from you as well. Let's get the full range of opinions here. Let's keep it civil and not abusive. Uh, but let's, let's, in fact, make this room a model 
of what social media ought to be. Uh, are we passing this microphone around? Excellent. Okay. So please wait till the microphone gets to you. Now remember, we're being filmed. If you're if you're here, uh, but you said you were you were going to go. I don't know. If you said you were going to be out drinking and clubbing and taking drugs, and actually you've snuck away to the British Library to a debate, uh, then you have you have various options. You can say, please edit this bit out. Uh, you can disguise your voice, pretend to be somebody else. I don't think you're actually going to be filmed while speaking. I think it was recorded. You can say your name or not say your name. We really don't mind. Uh, okay, so uh, I see several hands going up already. I saw that one first in the middle. In fact, why don't you take those two and then go to the back? I'm going to take a number of points because I think we've heard a lot from the panel, uh, and then I'll come back and give the panel a word in reply. Hi. So can you all... This works? Cool. Because um, it feels like it's not working. Um, so you said there was a range of views. I think everyone had the same view, which is that there is a very set definition of trolling uh, and that essentially all the people, you know, someone used the words male and stale or male and pale, sorry. Um, there's a very set impression that people carrying out the trolling are white men in their basements who just don't like women and minorities. So I'm going get to get a bit autoethnographic here and I'd love to hear your responses to that. Um, a year or so ago, I set up a blog um, that was essentially critiquing or examining a popular feminist movement that I was observing on social media called the Feminist Project 2017. It was, I don't know if it reached a huge audience. Um, and in the course of this, one of my friends, my flatmate actually, who is a transsexual woman, wrote a piece for me, for my blog, uh, essentially criticizing or examining the difference between the transsexual community and the non-binary community who call themselves trans. Um, admittedly, she took a slightly humorous tone because that's her writing style. And within two days, we had a huge number of comments from non-binary and other people calling themselves trans who were threatening to beat her up, who wanted to silence her because she, as a trans woman, was oppressing the trans community. None of these people were male or pale, a lot of them, because I ended up, it turned out a lot of them were friends I knew in real life who'd found the blog through various means. Uh, and so essentially, that doesn't seem to fit your definition of trolling. Those are people trolling, as it were, but on behalf of social justice. So those would be people who, judging by the definitions you have all used of trolling, would actually be essentially campaigning for a greater equality. That's the impression that you've, you've all given me. On the other hand, they were all threatening violence against a trans woman. So how does that... like? If we are looking at these um, sort of artificial intelligence measures to look at free speech, they wouldn't pick that up necessarily. The general social arguments at the moment would go, good for them, they're fighting on behalf of oppressed communities, this is brilliant. And actually, no, they were crushing another woman's freedom of expression. And the most bullying I've had in my life, I've been, for about a decade, I've been a feminist campaigner. Started at university, I was gender equalities officer for my college. Um, I was, I received a lot of abuse and a lot of hate because I also wanted to campaign for awareness of male rape victims who make up about 43% of victims. Um, and I was told that I was a gender traitor, I was a rape apologist, and as a rape victim, that was insulting. And actually, online community hates people who do not stick to the current social justice rule of what you ought to say. The most abuse I've ever received has been from other women. And if you look at the UN's recent report on abuse online, you'll actually find that of people using words like slut and bitch and whore, over half of them are women online. So actually, I find the definition of trolling here to be really blunt and unhelpful. It's essentially just a means of crushing. I, I genuinely see it as a means of crushing freedom of expression because people are expressing views that aren't politically correct. And so I think, you know, using horrific terms like the n-word are appalling sorry um are wrong but that fits an entirely different category from trolling so i genuinely think that the de definition we've been using tonight is deeply unnuanced and unhelpful and kind of blind to the needs of people to have freedom of expression that was rambling that's why i like nice firework into the uh, debate <laughs> No, it's good. It's good. And you, did, and you didn't swear or anything. I think you're a model of intervention in debate. Uh, there was somebody near you. Yes, good. Okay. 
can I have my thunder back? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, there's going to be an echo because I didn't see a range of diversity of views at all. You're all saying that we need to go authoritarian. It's just, do the platforms do it on behalf of the government or does the government do it? Why don't you have a free speech advocate on your panel? Why don't you have someone who does this trolling? The definition you gave of trolling, I, I think is incredibly disingenuous, I'm sorry. That's, I don't think that's what people mean when they say trolling, cyber harassing, cyber stalking, I don't think that's trolling. That's a really extreme end. You, you, I think the conflation of those things which I would actually really support action against, this sustained harassment, I think that can be uh, pursued by law with posting a meme you don't like, posting rap lyrics, a 19-year-old uh, woman posting rap lyrics in tribute to her dead friend who is given six weeks community service and uh, I, I don't remember the amount of the fine, I'm sorry. I think that's a, an outrageous conflation. I think you conflating online comments with violence, being glassed in the street is the same as getting a stupid comment. I, I think that's incredibly disingenuous. It's not helpful at all. I, I think it's really telling that everyone on this panel wants control, wants to stop people saying things they don't want. You. Uh, you wanted to, you sounded like you were lamenting that you couldn't see into private groups. That's terrifying. Do you, do you not all find that terrifying? <laughs> that there's no sense of privacy here? Great, good. <laughs> I think, you've got, I think you're, you're, there's a lot of resonance out here. Uh, good, thank you again for widening the discussion, wider than the panel did. There was, I think there was another hand. Was there one behind or was that you? Maybe that was you. Uh, there was one at the back over there, yep. Hi, thank you. Uh, I wrote one question, but it's kind of already been said. So I'll just really quickly read it out, but you can ignore it and then I'll, I'll give you a different one instead. Uh, Odd how the debate was structured. Four out of five, really four, out and four and a half out of five speakers only highlighted problems with free speech. Nimco did a great job demonstrating one advantage of free speech, which is the ability to speak truth to power about controversial issues. Uh, the, Kate and Ho the Katie Hopkins tweet, which was supposed to be an example of uh, offensive speech that perhaps should not be on the uh, platform, actually got some laughs. So that opens another question about whether offensive comedy uh, should be allowed on these platforms or not, which I didn't hear addressed. Um, but anyway, that's basically what the other two questions were about, so we'll skip that. Um, my question is to uh, the uh, Amnesty International uh, speaker. Uh, the think tank Demos analyzed over two million tweets and found that male celebrities receive more abusive tweets per capita than females. Uh, given that you're a human rights foundation, uh, not a female rights foundation, I found it odd that you only spoke about women in this context, that there was nothing about males who receive a huge amount of, of abuse. And indeed, you know, there are examples of men being killed, like, for example, counter-strike arguments that end in one man going to another man's house and stabbing him to death. It's, it's clearly a human rights issue, uh, not a female exclusively rights issue. So I thought it was odd the way that you didn't even mention why you were just looking at it as a female issue. I mean, it would have made sense if you, you said, well, I'm one thinker who thinks about this in this way. At Amnesty, Inter at Amnesty International, we have speakers who think about it in other ways. Or, but you literally just assume the whole audience would follow along as to why this is only needs to be analyzed from a female perspective. Uh, thanks. When the specific things, can you just make a note of them and come out because we've got we've got a real momentum going in the audience and I'd like to keep it going for another couple of minutes. Um, so there's a hand in the middle that I saw earlier and then one at the back. Yeah, yeah. Hi, my question's like a lot less um, polarizing and <laughs> probably a lot less interesting. That's all right, it's not compulsory to be polarizing. <laughs> to know. Um, so I kind of wanted to go back to just social media data for public policy use or social um, science research and that, so we see a lot of social media data being used for commercial purposes and we understand sort of the threshold for that is very low, but when we're, I guess if you are in a space where you're trying to do, to use social uh, media data for social science applications or for public policy, to, to sort of explore certain public policy issues, 
you know, can we talk about the ethics of, of using that data, um, sort of the methodologies and the ways that we can reduce uh, um, problems with, that, with using that data that might come up? Okay, so ethics of using social media data for, for research. Yeah, Brilliant. I think there's a couple of people who could address that. And then there was a hand right at the back there, and then I'll come forward. Um, setting aside for a second what we should do about this problem, I was wondering if any of you could just look into the future for a minute and have a think about what will happen. Like In 10 years' time, what will this problem look like? Will the platforms just have set up algorithms that solve this problem? Will governments have done something? What do you think is actually going to happen? Or is nothing going to change and it's going to be a sort of Wild West internet where anything can happen? Marvellous. Good. I like that big open question. You might actually you might want to save that and kind of come to that at the end. And, uh, and there was another, there was two hands actually at the front. Oh, we've had somebody there that I'd missed. Okay. So, so we take that one, then we take these two at the front, and then panel, you'll get a chance to answer back. Um, for the person on the right, uh, you said about the private Facebook groups. Um, do you think we should be policing private groups if it doesn't, is it still considered abusive? to people if it's private. Very good and concise question, admirable. Uh, so both the people by the aisle on the front had a question. Um, kids nowadays, I'm going to sound like an old man now. Uh, kids. Could you, sorry, could you speak up a bit because although there's a microphone, sure. the microphone's going to the camera and not really, so the people at the back are going, okay. what's can that man saying? <laughs> okay. Feel free uh, to stand up if you like, although the cameraman will hate you. Okay. Uh, Kids nowadays have access to far more powerful communication tools than any of us have ever had. And I think we're doing a really bad job as a society in training them how to use them responsibly and how to behave appropriately with these technologies. And I'm curious to know if uh, anyone is aware, panel or audience, of institutional educational initiatives to help train children. I think we're still teaching our children to grow up in, a, in the world that we grew up in. And I, I think we need to figure out how to reform the system. Marvelous. So uh, are we educating kids at all or badly? And uh, come to you, madam. Yes. Um, I'm one of the older generation. I'm 75 now. And, um, and I remember a time when we didn't have the internet compared to this lady here, whose, um, whose life um, has always been with the internet. But I would like to ta um, um, take up an issue which um, I think Rob Proctor said as to where does the responsibility lie. The responsibility lies with ourselves. We don't have to put up with uh, the nastiness on Twitter or Facebook. I don't, do not subscribe to any of the social media uh, for that particular reason. You don't have to put up with it. And by using it, you're just only sort of um, encouraging more of, um, of the nastiness. You don't know who you're talking to on, on the internet. You don't know what they're doing with your information or who they're passing it on to. I mean, the question that you have to ask yourselves is this. Um, would you stop a stranger in the street and start telling them your personal details? You probably wouldn't. But you do that online. Why? I just can't understand, you know, the issue here. Um, if you don't like it, if it found you, if you find that the social media is upsetting, is abusive, is harassing, or whatever, then don't use it. Unsubscribe. There you are. Delete, delete all of them. Uh, you can actually get back to me because I'm just. <laughs> Right, that was fantastic. Well done, audience, because to be honest, I'm probably the nearest thing to a free speech fundamentalist on this panel, and I'm chairing, so I was hoping that I would not have to be putting that point of view, and you have admirably done it for me. So, panel, look, don't feel you have to respond to everything, obviously, because uh, that would be the, just take us to the end of the time we have, uh, unless it was something specifically addressed to one of you, in which case, please do. Uh, there, were, there were some less polarizing questions, a question about ethical use of social media data for research. Um, there was a question about how do we raise children to behave properly in a medium which is not necessarily our native medium. Uh, and then there were the really hard-hitting questions. Are you basically a bunch of authoritarians who want to pry into people's private conversations and police them? 
I'm uh, I'm summing up, but I think that was a pretty good summary. So so I think uh, I think you deserve a chance to respond to that. Who would like to chip in first? All of you, very good. Okay, well in that case, I'm going to pass it here, and then you can pass the microphone along that way. So I'd actually like to say I'm really grateful for the question about opening up the definition of trolling um, because it was something I was actually thinking about as, as people were talking. Um, I realized I did not put forth the definition of trolling, um, but I, I think that's an excellent question. Um, so I do want to say that I, in bringing up my, my worry about leaving it to legislation and leaving it to platforms alone, Part of my point about that worry was wondering who, how transparent are they going to be about who's going to make the decisions about whose speech is okay and whose is not. And I do think that there's a way for us to extend trolling to include um, activity that is actually not being threatening or abusive, but in fact being something that is calling to task um, people who are doing horrible things in the world or who have already said horrible things. So I do think that there's the possibility of saying what one person might call trolling is in fact social justice work. So I think that that's a really interesting question to raise. And I do think that, <coughs> I don't know, maybe this is my American sensibility. I do think that, <laughs> oh no, that's horrible. Um, I do think that there is something important about uh, keeping some of that open, allowing people to express that. I also would say, as just a final thing, I don't believe that trolling is limited to um, male and pale. I think that it, it goes quite um, across many places, which is part of why coming back around to thinking about it being more of a community-based um, and multi-leveled multi approach is important. Um, yeah, I said um, the board of Twitter was male and pale, not necessarily um, the trolls. Um, and I, I definitely do not um, believe in limiting um, free freedom of speech. But with great power comes great responsibility. And I think it's about looking into those kind of conversations. As somebody who, who understands the mob mortality of dehumanizing somebody to, to the point where their death or rape or abuse is legitimized, we have to have that conversation. We are not in a place where people used to write their private thoughts into. So you, you are entitled to however sick and ridiculous your thoughts are. You are ridiculous to tell that into the ethos and say whatever you are. But you are not entitled to put that in a platform which can actually incite hate and create mob mentality that is why we have legislation against criminality that's why we have all these other things you cannot um congregate in a pu public area and ask for the lynching of me because i say that fgm should end but you can do that on twitter those things are unacceptable so we have to talk about acceptability and i don't necessarily think it's about le new legislation it's about having those conversations um so and i do understand that there are um in in terms of one of the co um, conversations about private groups it's a little bit like that it's the fact that if we are having conversations about talking about people i know that for a fact that a tweet um, that that, um, that was sent on March the 15th, 2015, led to me being hit by a car. The, I, so that, con that link is there, that's a criminal act. It's not about the freedom of speech, but it's the criminal act that, that was committed. And does Twitter have a role to play in that? When I, when I reported it and it said that, that it didn't violate its, um, um, its um, policies, it, they do have a role. So it's about, it, it's about these platforms actually taking their responsibility on task. So I just wanted to say that I'm not about limited free speech, but I'm actually talking about us having real responsibility and doing something about these um, platforms and the people that are sharing them, because these are not just those people in the dungeons of their um, parents' rooms writing in their diaries. They're now writing and collecting a lot of fans, and it's quite dangerous out there. So I just wanted to say the fact that we need to be worried, and that does link to um, women, it links to young people in gangs, it links to men, it links to every single, um, gender and um, every single race within our society. Thank you. Um, well, uh, as regards the definition of, of trolling, um, what, I, what I tried to do was to offer s some different definitions, um, one which um, takes a fairly narrow view of what, it's, uh, what it is and might be exemplified by uh, the conduct of people like Katie Hopkins um, and uh, uh, I don't think anybody's calling for for that version of trolling to be um, uh, to be taken down. I think what I said in remark addressing that, I was more interested in how people res 
respond. And some people obviously thought she should be accountable for saying those things. Um, the other definition obviously has a much wider range. And I think for the purposes of, of, of this debate, it does allow us to get into a wider range of issues about freedom of speech and, and, and responsibility uh, and uh, freedom from harm. So um, I don't think, well, certainly from my point of view, I don't think anybody was arguing for um, uh, taking authoritarian um, uh, actions in, in trying to um, uh, limit people's freedom of speech. But I, what I, I think what we're all arguing for is that people have to be accountable for what they say. And uh, that accountability might include having to be answerable to the law because um, what they say may be uh, viewed as being uh, contrary to, to, to law. I'll come, I'll come back to you. I will come back to you. And, and, but ultimately, it's a decision of society um, and everybody in society about what is acceptable conduct. Um, I, I don't think anybody here is trying to lay down uh, the rules about what is acceptable. I think what we're trying to talk about is how when we arrive at a set of rules which we think cover what we think is acceptable conduct uh, in, in, in social media, in, in these online spaces, we, we, we do need to have ways of ensuring that conduct can be measured and, and accountable against those, against those principles. Um, unless you think there should be no principles about what is acceptable conduct, then I don't think we're disagreeing uh, that there, sh there needs to be some way of managing the way we interact in these spaces. And that's what we're trying to do. And it's going to involve a range of different measures, uh, including the um, uh, responsibility uh, of individuals to, to, to say what they feel about what other people are doing. It obviously has responsibility on the part of platforms because um, uh, they may be uh, legally responsible for some kinds of content uh, uh, being, put, uh, being put up and never have to act. And of course, as society considers the risks that um, social media uh, may raise for people's um, well-being and safety, uh, if certain kind of content is not removed, uh, it's up to us to, to think about how we evolve these frameworks so that they, are, they represent what society views are about what, what is acceptable in terms of behaviour in these, in these online spaces. Okay, thank you. I'm going to pass the thing this way. Now, there was a specific question to you mm -hmm. about uh, is, is yours the only work that Amnesty is doing on this, mm -hmm. or uh, are you also worried about male celebrities? I'm going to answer a few. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer a few, a few of the questions. Um, first of all, I think your point was really important around um, sort of elevating or emphasizing what Nimco was saying about Twitter and other social media platforms being a really, really important space for, for people to freely express themselves. So all of the journalists and bloggers and women that I interviewed talked about how important Twitter was as a platform for them and how they wanted to be on those spaces, but also that they need to be on those spaces in a lot of instances. So if you're a politician, it's the way that you can engage with your constituencies outside of you know traditional working hours. Um, if you're a freelance journalist, it's the way that you get work. So I think one of the reasons why this sort of silencing and censoring impact of um, you know online abuse um, is so important is because women want to be on these platforms. Um, in terms of why only women, um, you know, of course, people of all genders, um, including men, receive you know online abuse. That's this is not to say that only women experience online abuse, um, but the way that Amnesty is looking at this issue is we're framing it as an extension of the existing discrimination and violence that women experience in the offline world, um, which is disproportionate, uh, disproportionately affects women. So the reason why we're looking at this is not because we're saying that men don't experience violence or abuse against women, but we're saying that there are spe specific forms of violence and abuse um, that women specifically face. So we did an online poll uh, where we um, asked women across eight countries about their experiences of abuse or harassment on social media platforms more broadly. And what we found is that uh, about a quarter of the women said they had experienced abuse or harassment. And of that, um, about 26% said that they had experienced threats of physical or sexual assault. And about half of them had said that they experienced um, sexist or misogynistic commentary. So there is a gendered element to the abuse um, and violence that women experience online. Um, and then lastly, just to touch upon the, the definitions and the scale, um, 
I'm not saying that our definition is how we define trolling. I'm just saying that the way that Amnesty frames this issue is through a human rights framework, and we use the terminology violence and abuse. That's not to say that violence and abuse are the same thing. There's obviously a huge scale and a degree of what that can um, constitute. So obviously, you can have a rape threat against someone, um, which can have you know an impact on someone's freedom of expression. But you can also have um, you know sort of lower level misogynistic comments, which through my research with younger women especially, found can actually have a, a silencing or censoring impact as well. And it is that sort of like persistent harassment. So a really common example of um, a misogynistic comment to, to women online and on Twitter is, you know, go back to the kitchen or shut up and make a cup of tea, which in isolation, you know, you probably think, oh, just grow with thicker skin, get over it. Um, and we're not, we're not saying that that content shouldn't be allowed to be on Twitter. We're not saying that that should be censored or that should be taken down. But what we're seeing is that those kind, that kind of commentary does have um, a freedom of expression impact. It does have a silencing and censoring impact. So it's about you know, what can social media companies do? There's obviously a varying level of responsibility depending on the degree of violence and abuse. We're not clumping it all together. In some instances, it may just be that someone, a company like Twitter um, should make sure that their sort of um, safety policies, for example, are better, um, you know, more people are aware of them and people are able to curate a safer, less toxic environment versus a rape threat, which is against their own um, policies on violent or on hateful conduct and abuse, which then, you know, they need to interpret and uh, uh, provide the appropriate penalty. So there's a wide range, and we're not trying to conflate the two. Um, I'm just saying that the, the way that we frame the issue is violence and abuse. So George, are you really an authoritarian who thinks that nobody should have a private conversation anywhere without you stepping in to check that nobody's being racist or sexist in private and reporting them to the police? I'm actually hoping to take up a job with Cambridge Analytica soon so I can get everyone's data in there. Um, no, so, um, I mean, I guess because two of our audience uh, mentioned it. So, yeah, I mean, I think what's very important to... Um, sort of clear clear up here is that it's not about saying that there should be no such thing as private groups that you know i think privacy and a anonymity on the internet is quite important particularly you know there are campaigners um you know lgbt campaigners for instance in countries where being uh being part of that community is illegal and that's important to have that um to, to, to have that ability to organize to you know but ultimately as well uh, on the other side of it, you know, th this debate, there's always, you know, there's always several angles you have to look at it at, and, and the fact is, Nimco touched on it, you know, a tweet directly led to a, a violent attack on her in real life. And again, not two weeks ago, um, uh, Alec Minassian um, murdered 10 people in Toronto with his car, and now he has someone, he's someone who, and I will use the term radicalised, have been radicalised, um, online in, uh, you know, on the notorious sort of incels um, Reddit forum, you know, so this is not, this is not just some idea that, you know, you can't uh, dismiss online culture and online behaviour as something, wow, it's just, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, you know, it, it, it's, you know, social media and, and, and the internet is a central part of, of, of society now, and it, it, we're not going to go back to a, a time when, you know, people aren't using the internet anymore. So, you, you know, there has to be a consideration that there is real life consequences. So if on a private group, there, are, there is, first of all, if there are people being abused on that private group, there needs to be, a, a, you know, mechanisms by which it can be reported. Equally, if people are organising on private groups, whether that's, uh, you know, um, people on the far right, but whether that's, you know, um, you know, Islamist terrorists, you know, whether, you know, there needs to be an ability to, you know, whether that's, you know, people of all, you know, all kinds of different extreme um, parts of the internet, you know, there needs to be an ability to tackle that. So ultimately, if, you know, you can, you can argue that, you know, should be ultimate privacy online, but that will have real life consequences. Um, a, a, a couple sort of other things that were mentioned, I think it's important as well to realise that, I think you touched on it, in that, Free speech advocates, um, you know, I think free speech is an, is an important value. I, I, I work for an organisation that we're a campaigning organisation. We need social media to be, be able to utilise our speech to campaign for the values we believe in. But what people don't always, um, what uh, free speech advocates don't always consider is the fact that some people's free speech may be suppressing pe other people's free speech. So if, 
like a few people have touched on, you know, that there are people out there who are targeting women or targeting men or targeting uh, individuals or groups and utilizing their free speech to do so, they may be su suppressing other people's. So, you know, it, it doesn't just go one way. You have to consider, you know, that this is a nuanced debate and there has to be a, a multitude of approaches to it. And that's not to say you just, you close all the Facebook groups and etc. cetera. But, um, yeah, and I just think, and also on the trolling definition, I think you're right, you know, but I, I think perhaps it's maybe slightly unhelpful to even use the term trolling. No one's talking about making trolling illegal. It's yeah. hate speech, descriptive. Thank you again for that. But um, uh, hate speech, so just, uh, uh, the language that is discriminatory and illegal under law. No one's saying that if, you know, if you, you know, I say sometimes if I try and wind up a mate and then he'll be like, uh, you know, and he gets annoyed about it, I'll say, don't, sorry, just trolling, you know what I mean? So the term trolling is obviously a very broad term. So it's not about banning, you know, wind ups. It's about hateful speech that has real life impact whether it incites violence or, you know, affects someone's me mental health. Now, we are technically, because this got so lively, we're technically on the time we should stop now. But I've already seen two people who spoke before want to speak again. So what I'm going to do in a radical shift to the normal uh, format of these debates, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically give the audience the last word. Uh, and then if the panel want to come back or anything, for a change, you will have to find them in the bar <laughs> and tell them while, while they're wrong. Yeah, make it quick. Yeah, no, no, I just, I just think, I've just been sitting here listening. I think we need to find the online equivalent of shouting fire in a packed room. Because I think that is, that is the thing that we don't have the context in which, which um, we're controlling the online space. So there is a qualification to free speech. So we just, that, that is how we need to work out what shouting fire on the online platform is. This, this is the, the usual argument that speech in real life is free unless you are unless your speech constitutes an action which has immediate proximate consequences. So look, so I saw a hand there that I haven't heard from before. Ah, look at you, are all going now. Okay, please be concise and to the point. So there's a hand there, there's a hand there, there's a hand there, there's a hand there, and then there's two people who spoke before. Uh, I'm really sorry, we haven't answered your question about ethical research either. I know, but you just got too lively. It, it, ask them in the bar. Okay, so... Uh, so, so, and, and be, be stern. Look at them sternly while they're speaking, so they're concise. Okay, start at that end. Hello, I'm uh, Ross McEwen. I'm a, a law student and a former staff member of the Scottish National Party. So there was a, a few points there raised. Um, one of the things that we, and this is going to be super quick, I promise. Um, I'm learning firsthand at uh, university of the deep, dark, depressing, and rank, incompetent way that we're dealing with algorithm, algorithmic decision-making in law, we can't do it, we're terrible at it, and the private sector actually prevents us from learning how these decisions are made in law. So having algorithms to detect what hateful or discriminatory speech is just won't work, and it's a, a very rum idea, and I don't think it will ever. The male and pale argument and nearly sent me to sleep. It's too old, it doesn't apply to this anymore. No one mentioned the Kanye West thing that's happening just now in the US, which is the most outrageous piece of trolling I've seen in a long time. Um, Milo Yiannopoulos was in London last week at the Day for Freedom um, march outside Downing Street, which was not reported on any of the major news outlets. There was four and a half thousand people there calling for freedom of speech. Um, so perhaps the, the state isn't really uh, enabling that already. To your to you, sir, on the right. The but you can't have five points. Okay, okay, my, well, last one, my, last one, my last one. The method of reporting Hateful acts already exist. It's called the police. Okay, good. Uh, next to you. Hi, I'm Sam Dickinson. I work in internet governance um, globally. So it's quite interesting listening to this conversation, which is on a national level. Um, just as a mind expanding concept, um, the danger of looking at things the way we have today, which is on a national basis, is that when we're talking about um, what is unacceptable speech at a national level, other countries that are less democratic then use that to suppress speech generally. So that, that was just a comment that this is not just a national issue, this is international and it's a much wider dialogue. Very good point, well made and concise. Uh, so it's a hand there, yes, and then, uh, oh, and them on there, yeah. Hi, so um, I'm 16 and I would say looking around I'm definitely one of the youngest people in this audience and there's been a lot of talk here about 
um, the youth and how it's going to change in the future. And the words used were training them responsibly and how are we training them responsibly. And I just think you can train people as people and parents can train their children how they want to make them grow up. But you can't train us to use on like online social media. You can't train us to use this because we've had our whole life using this. We probably know quite a lot more than our parents do <laughs> about this. So I just don't think that we're going to be trained to use social media well enough by our parents when we can train ourselves pretty well about that so maybe you need to train us <laughs> uh, and there's a hand here yeah and then and the two people behind you spoke before yeah good evening i might be your only supporters um i did like what you guys all said i agree i used to be a criminal defense solicitor um, i'm now a counterterrorism consultant um i've seen some of the disgusting stuff said about diane abbott on facebook Twitter, and I try to speak out whenever I see it. I've seen nasty things said about trans women, and I speak out in their defense. Um, and when I also find nasty comments from feminists to men, I speak out, and I get abuse. And when I pray that feminists would defend Muslim women who are banned from wearing the niqab in France, it upsets me, so I can I get trolls and abuse from all spectrums. I, sometimes the feminists like me, and other times they hate me. But we must never conflate the fact that there is um, hate speech and free speech, so I agree on that. And I think social media, they need to be more bold. Where is black and white? If you're going to make a racist comment or incite hatred, I wish they would put up a board as you sign up saying anything that pertains to violence or aggression against anyone, not just ethnic minority, anyone, you could be liable for criminal prosecution. I guarantee that will reduce the chavs who've got no time but to abuse people and swear at people and be racist towards people. So I actually think social media needs to be a bit more bold. And I actually think they haven't been, not only have they not been bold, and that, and that shouldn't stop freedom of speech. People should still be able to say what they want even if you disagree with them. But when it comes to matters of violence or discrimination, or not discrimination, violence or hate speech that can incite, I think we need, that our government needs to pressurize social media and say, be bold and you'll silent the people that are actually uh, able to, uh, would commit those kind of actions or crimes. So. Thank you. I do find the word chav offensive, but... Uh, freedom of speech. <laughs> speech, exactly. I have my tongue slightly in my cheek now. OK, so, uh, so you two, even though you spoke before, you get the last word, so make it concise, make it punchy, yes. and remember, it's only you between us and the wine. <laughs> I'll do my best. Please don't kill me. Um, so my final point is that, based on all the definitions of trolling we've heard tonight, I think the biggest groups of trolls on the internet are intersectional feminists. I think in terms of real-life harm they cause, uh, hashtags like hashtag male tears are, and so one of the points was used was, oh, get back in the kitchen. One of the biggest things I've used to shut men up in debates when they raise disagreements with feminists is, you know, hashtag male tears, I don't care that you're upset. And the biggest killer of men between the ages of 18 and 49 is suicide. So I would argue if we're looking at real world harm, mocking men's emotional uh, expression and emotional pain is probably going to be a big context and I would love to see Amnesty care about that but I don't think they will. Good point well made. You get the last words, so I make it really good. No pressure, eh? I, I want to really applaud Nimco for not blocking. I think that's awesome and I want to applaud, uh, you, I'm sorry I didn't get your name. If, thanks. I think it's really great that you engage. It was terrifying that you said the downside with people challenging people one-on-one -on -one is it involves individual responsibility. How is that a bad thing? We have a differing range of opinions. And again, I don't feel there was much of a debate here because everyone wanted to enforce control over what other people could do online. And I think there wasn't enough solid evidence about the damage done. It was very anecdotal. And I think the trouble was it came from an ideological place and your ideologies were very strongly visible tonight. You told, you said, no one here is arguing about being authoritarian. I'm sorry if I'm misrepresenting you. You're talking about automatic algorithms to just stop people commenting. That's, a, that's authoritarian. You are saying the law might step in. So I'm free to do something, but then I might be criminally punished. That is not free. That's not free at all. I'm sorry if I misrepresented you, but that's what I heard. 
And again, I will pick up on the point. You talked extensively about risk. I would love to hear your response if I can just finish. Again, as it was already picked up, your, your ideology is so on show that you only looked at women. You didn't look at male MPs. How, how many abusive tweets did Jeremy Corbyn get? We don't have that benchmark. You only ask women about abuse online. You, this isn't good data. This is really bad science. You're going in with leading aims. If you ask women about abuse online, you're going to find out, oh, they get abuse online. Why not ask a broad range of people? OK, now I think no, things I'm are unravelling here. Other hands are going up. I did, I'm sorry, I did say you'd have the last word. Uh, in fact, I have the last word, obviously. It's my prerogative as chair. <laughs> give us a microphone. Uh, I'm going to say two things. One is... No, I'm going to say three things. One is thank you for a great debate. Thank you all for a great debate, because by, by coming in and expressing really diverse views, really civilly and mostly very concisely, you have, you have been a model. So the second thing I want to say is... I would like us all to think, how can we make places like Twitter more like the debate we've had this evening? Because I think it's an absolute model of disagreement in a way that's constructive and useful and thought-provoking. Um, and I'm sorry, panel, you didn't get a chance to answer back. This is a change from the usual format of these things. So you will indeed have to, you will have to go and find these people in the bar and argue with them <laughs> as a turnaround from what they usually have to do to you. Uh, so finally, please, I would like your thanks to the people who've organised this evening, the panellists who, who've put up and defended themselves against really robust criticism, and also yourselves for making this a really good quality debate. And now to the bar. But first, round of applause for everyone who's here.